Talking all things SEC football with Trey Wallace, who's a senior college sports writer for OutKick, one of the best in the business, someone I was able to meet for the first time in person down there at Dallas, Texas, which, again, is one of the great gifts of media days. It's for folks like like us. Again, Trey joins the show. Trey, what's going on, man? I appreciate you taking the time. It was great to finally meet you in person down there. Yeah, it media was – man, it was fun. It was a good time getting to, to, to see folks that I've, I've seen in the past. Um, it's kind of like the – you know, it's the start of our year in the business. You know that. And then getting to meet new folks and finally, you know, me and you face-to-face getting to meet. It was – it was good, man. It was a, it was an interesting week. It wasn't kind of like other SEC media days, and that's okay. Um, but uh, you know, Texas and Oklahoma got their welcoming, so I guess that's all that matters. Trey, let's start there. You mentioned Texas and Oklahoma, and of course, the phrase is "it just means more." Now, as you add those two new members, and of course, the event was in Dallas. Did it feel like it meant more to you? than previous years with those two new members? I, th- I think it was a buildup, brother, of of four years of waiting. You know, being in Hoover when the news broke from the Houston Chronicle, you know, th- three or four years, 2021. Um, and, and, and then getting to the point where we were last week with Texas and Oklahoma finally here, and then Radio Row, you know, it's kind of filled with Texas and Oklahoma radio stations and – the, the 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 you know all the media getting there it felt like okay we're here like okay we we kind of made it to this point with Texas and Oklahoma it's still weird you know it's still weird to see even see like a big 12 preseason poll and not see Oklahoma or Texas near the top um but I think overall I think yeah I think SEC media days you know it started with spring meetings you know and having the 80s and everybody having a vote down there and whatnot and then you get to Dallas and it was just kind of the cherry on top is, okay, here we go. Like, two new teams are in the conference. This is going to be an interesting year. Like, finally, reality is, is, is here. I think that's the best way. Mm. Trey, I saw you in the big room, room and again, across, across also uh, SEC Media Days asking different questions, talking with coaches. What were some of your biggest takeaways you took away from the week? Did anything jump out to you? I know it's a week where typically you kind of have to – Read between the lines because these coaches and players are so buttoned up. Yeah, I mean, it, look, I, I think that as as a couple people kind of mentioned to me in different ways, um, nobody wanted to go viral this year, <laughs> uh, especially with the twelve team playoff happening. Uh, didn't want something to come bite him in the butt, you know, in November or whatnot. Maybe that's why we didn't see a lot from Eli <laughs> in terms of of talking uh, in, in moments. But I think you know, I, I think a couple things. I, I think the what is if Sam Pittman and Arkansas don't get things figured out this year, what does Hunter Juracek end up doing after giving Sam Pittman kind of a, you know, not a pass, but saying, hey, you need to make some changes. He brought in Bobby Petrino. Can Bobby Petrino be the savior for Sam Pittman this year? Meaning, can they get to seven wins? I think that would probably suit Arkansas fans, you know, and, and keep Sam in that spot. But also at the same time, like Sam Pittman and and speaking with him and and some others around the program, it's like he understands it. Like he gets it. Like if things don't go well, like he's going to go drink beer at his lake house and he's going to live off, you know, for a couple of years, you know, and he's going to get back in the game as an offensive line coach. Like that just – so it's not like he's ready, but he's not stupid. He understands the situation this year, uh, even with green of quarterback position even with Bobby Petrino there, I think that's something to keep an eye on. I think the Billy Napier stuff kind of only intensifying, in my opinion. I know what the schedule looks like. Everybody's seen the schedule. That's fine. To me, it's how competitive are you in the back part, tough part of that schedule? You know, if you're going out and you're losing by 10 points, okay, I, I could see that 14 points mm-hmm. like, but if there's a game in there where you lose by 21 or 24 and uh, you look sloppy playing football and, you know, let's just say Graham Mertz, who I think is going to have a decent year. Let's just say he has a bad year, you know, and you're having to put DJ Lagway in there, you know, halfway point, something they don't want to do. They don't want to play DJ this year unless they have to. Kind of the same thing Tennessee did with Nico. Um, so I look at the Florida situation as – they better get this thing figured out or they're going to have to make a move the start of November. You can't wait longer. That was kind of my biggest takeaway from the Florida side of it is how quick they would have to make the move if they feel like Billy is not the guy long term. So, you know, we are in a different age now. That's why I asked the question about recruiting calendars and, and what's that life like? 
the biggest thing is you got to get a head start. And a lot of teams are defining head starts in a different way. I mean, look at the schools last year that were making moves. You know, and and so you get to that point where you can't be, you cannot have a head coach or not have your future decided, you know, by Thanksgiving because you got the transfer portal, you got high school recruiting. By the way, playoffs are going to be going on, so you might get a little bit of head start on other teams when it comes to the recruiting aspect of the portal. So there's a lot of stuff. So I think I think Arkansas, Florida, and and then I think probably last, you know, I think the reality of Texas and Quinn Ewers, what that I thought Steve Sarkeesian killed it. I thought he did a great job. Um, and, and I think that this is a football team that should be playing for a national championship. Wouldn't surprise me if they lost in the semis, but should be playing for a national championship. And and just how much pressure – I use that word with, with two other people uh, in, in Dallas. Pressure is on Texas to come in and make sure that they look like the team they're supposed to look like this year. Like that to me – is one of the biggest things that stands out because I know what they've lost from last season, but they still got a hell of a lot of talent. And and if they can come out, you know, the biggest thing to me is if they come out and they, they let's just say they're 10 and three or, or, or whatever, that's not a successful season, you know, in, in your first year in the SEC because of your expectations of what you've done in previous years. So I'll be fascinated with that matchup at Michigan. Um, and then I think we're going to get a real good look at, at what the Longhorns have this year. Trey, it's a great segue because you mentioned, of course, Steve Sarkeesian in Texas. I wanted to ask you about Texas and Oklahoma, circling back to them. First SEC media days, your thoughts on both what you heard from Sark, Venables, and then, you know, do you feel like, because I, I seem to find some split decisions or split opinions, rather, on Texas and Oklahoma from the standpoint, is there going to be an adjustment period in the SEC? Maybe a little bit more for Oklahoma than Texas, although Sooners folks don't want to hear that. I mean, your overall thoughts on what you heard from the SEC media days and the front they put up that we're ready to come in, win at the highest level. Maybe what's the reality in your mind of what the adjustment period is going to be like in year one? I think Oklahoma, the obvious statement here is Oklahoma is going to have a tougher than Texas. You know, I, I think that – Schedule alone. <laughs> right, right. And and even with what the Sooners have at quarterback, wide receiver, you know, Jackson – like, I, I get it. I, I know what Oklahoma has. I just think it's going to be – an interesting reality for them if they are hanging back with, and this is, I'm just throwing out teams so people don't hate me, but if they're hanging back with Kentucky, Mississippi State, teams like that, you know, in the conference this year, you know, back through that, let's just say eight through 12 area ranking wise, I think that's what's going to be kind of weird for Oklahoma fans. Um, because I do think that they have the talent. And another thing too, like some of these matchups are getting, you know, like, Tennessee could go to Oklahoma and lose, you know, the, the, the Texas, Arkansas, you know, you throw in, you know, some of Oklahoma. these are games that are going to be so fresh and new and, and to me, very, very interesting because, you know, like a, let's just say like an Oklahoma, Arkansas game or something like that. Like these are games that Oklahoma can drop, by the way, Texas could do the same thing. Now we've seen Texas going to Tuscaloosa and handle business. And I understand that, but you know, and I'm again, I'm throwing out a team. Like, what if Texas is going to play Kentucky at a night game or something like that? And, I, and I'm even talking about in, in the years upcoming. I just think it's going to be so different. And I just look at the situation as there's potential we've seen around the SEC for upsets all the time. And I'm not, you know, I mean, even Vanderbilt beat Florida, Kentucky two years ago in back to back weeks. I'm just saying there are going to be chances. So overall, I would say Oklahoma kind of came in. Uh, as a as a stable talking point during media days. Mm. Like, Venables got up there, said what he had to say, answered some questions, you know, like, we're here type of deal. Steve Sarkeesian got up there and started giving a filibuster and <laughs> and, and just he, – he felt so – maybe it's because he's been around the conference a good amount. Um, and not saying Venables, but, I, but being around the coaches and whatnot and understanding – I think the situation is a little bit bigger for Texas in this sense of there's so many expectations for them this year to go play for a national championship or be in contention. What Steve Sarkeesian did, the way he answered questions, the way he got up there and talked about his team, the way I, I just thought he handled it extremely well. And that was one of my biggest takeaways was, okay, Sark is all business here. Like nothing's changed, you know, besides the conference. So 
I, I just think he did a very good job of setting up what the Longhorns could look like. And not saying Brent Venables didn't. I just, it was more mellow with Oklahoma. Texas is like in your face. So that that was, and I'm just talking about from the platform, you know, from the podium and then the other platform to the side with all the players and whatnot. You know, I, I just thought Texas kind of, you know, they didn't set off fireworks inside, but they kind of set off some fireworks inside. It was kind of weird. Trey, of the coaches that are feeling pressure or are starting to feel pressure, you mentioned Billy Napier, Sam Pittman. Speaking of filibusters, Shane Beamer, uh, maybe Jeff Levy in year one at Mississippi State, Clark Lee at Vandy. Uh, any of those guys, were there any of those that after listening to them, and, and I know, again, from the podium, there's only so much you can learn and take away, but were there any of those guys you listened to and thought, Maybe I feel a little bit better about this guy and his situation and him being the leader of this program. Or uh, did, did you get that feeling with any of those guys that maybe this thing is on the up and up and we're making too much of their impending demise, if you will? I think Jeff Lebby is going to be fine. It's just going to take a couple of years. Mississippi State fans have got to be patient with Jeff Lebby. I think you're going to score some points. Um, I think that uh, – Everybody talked about how good the hire was, even talking with those other coaches off the record. Like they like Jeff Levy. They think he can do some things at, at Mississippi State. Can he get past what's going on north of him in Oxford? <laughs> Not at the moment. And that's okay. That's okay. You, you're going to need time with Levy. He's got to bring in his players and, and, and establish his offense. And, you know, I, I, I look at the whole situation. Clark Lee of Vanderbilt. You know, interesting dynamic to me because they're building a new building a new stadium. They're adding on to the stadium. Um, you have got some NIL help, but unfortunately, Clark Lee's just a rough spot, man. Like he joined the conference, you know, when he, and you add two more teams to it, so you're that further down the list uh, when it comes to rankings. I think Clark Lee's a great guy. I think he's a great coach, um, but I think he's in a, a no win situation. At, at Vanderbilt right now. So, I, you know, that means they're going to give you more time. That's the biggest thing. And, and I completely would agree with that. Um, I think Shane Beamer, this is an interesting year for South Carolina. They came off two years ago. When they came off that, that three-game stretch where they beat Tennessee, beat Clemson, lost that fun, awesome, great game at the Gator Bowl against Notre Dame, I was like, Okay, all right. Let let's see what Carolina's got. You know, next season. Like this is this is interesting. And then you had what happened last year. You know, and I feel like this is one of those years where Shane's got to go out and prove it for his job. Um, and I think it's because how big the SEC continues to get. Also, at the same time, you know, again, Texas and Oklahoma coming in, so you know, in the format to play for an SEC championship I, I and their schedule. I, I just feel like Shane Beamer, um, they, they've done a good job when it comes to recruiting. They they have. I mean, but to me, it's it's about putting it on the field. Um, so I don't know if – I don't know if I want to say like hot seat pressure is on Shane, but you've got folks in Carolina that want to see it now. Life without Spencer Rattler, who had his ups and downs in Columbia – what does that look like? To me, that's one of the the interesting storylines kind of floating underneath the radar a little bit is, is what's going on in Columbia. Trey, stock up, stock down, leaving mm -hmm. SEC media days. Was there anybody else that you walked away, whether it was not even just listening to coaches, but maybe talking to the local media? I think that's really, Trey, where you learn the most is talking with those guys that are on the beat, know the team, know the ins and outs. From folks you talked to, was there any other programs at media days that you left media days saying, Maybe you felt a little bit better about this team, a little bit worse, or, or did you kind of feel the way you felt the same way leaving Dallas? I would say, and I, I, I hate to say this, like being high on a team coming out of media days, but <laughs> it's that time of year. It is the season. And talking with folks, I like, <laughs> I think the situation is a little bit better than, at, at Auburn than what people are letting on. Um, I, I think when there are a lot of folks excited about Peyton Thorne and what he has done in the last six months to, to progress his game. And I think underneath Hugh Freeze in this offensive system, I think he can find some success. And I think with Jarquez Hunter at running back, one of the best running backs in the conference, 
if they can fulfill that on the offensive line and give Jark West some damn running room, okay, then this thing is going to play out where maybe you're looking at seven, eight wins, but you're competitive in these games. Um, kind of like what we saw you know, against Georgia last year. You know what I mean? So I, I, I just feel like with the Hugh Freeze situation that he's starting to get a couple pieces in uh, that, that he wanted. And I think this could be maybe a little bit better of a season than, than some might imagine. I, I don't know. We got to get, you know, we get to fall camp and you pray to God, everybody comes out injury free. Um, and you're able to, 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 to stabilize what you want to do on offense for the upcoming season. The only thing that worries me, you know, is a linebacker position, what comes down to it, you know, on the defensive front too, Chris. So I, I, like you right now, um, not saying, you know, buy stock and he's going to be coach of the year. I'm just saying that could be the interesting factor. And then the other takeaway is what is, how's Garrett Mus Nussmeyer this year with LSU? You go from Jaden Daniels to Garrett Nussmeyer, two different quarterbacks, you know, and, and I know Garrett has wheels. I get that, but two different offenses that, that could potentially be trying to be ran here. You know, I don't, I don't know how much RPO, you know, Karen Nussmeyer is going to be doing compared to Jaden Daniels. So I look at the LSU situation and I say, okay, looking at years past opening games against Florida State, I know it's easy to say, but we are going to find a lot out about them when they go to Las Vegas and have to play USC to open the season. So that's where I look at LSU and I'm like, okay, like, okay, let's figure out, you know, what this running back situation looks like. Garrett Nussmeyer in the pocket trying to get the ball down the field, has the defense look like, cause they should beat USC to open the season, but you go out there and you lose that game and things get interesting. Like we, and it's crazy to say, but we saw, you know, look how wild it's gotten with Florida state over the last two years. Um, so I think those two right there kind of not a stock up, stock down type of situation, but I, I'm a little bit more impressed with Auburn and I'm very more intrigued with LSU with that schedule. Trey, the SEC media released their predicted order of finish <laughs> outside of Vanderbilt and South Carolina getting a combined three votes to win the conference. Uh, did you take much issue or was there anything egregious you felt like the media missed in their predicted order to finish? I, I always find that fascinating because you know the SEC <laughs> officials, Chuck and Craig Pinkerton and all those guys uh, and Herb, they know who voted for Vanderbilt. Okay, so like I always I, I, and Trey, I love fun, but at least come public with it. At least go public <laughs> because with it. it happens every year. I mean, right. it, 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 this happens every year. There's a, there's some kind of sick running joke between a couple of reporters, you know, in, in, at these media days. Hey, we're gonna vote for Vanderbilt, um, I, but SEC knows who did it, so I'm I'm sure it's uh, whatever. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I, I I think that I think when you look at it, I mean, it, right here, I mean, you, Georgia won. Um, 300 pretty much more points over Texas, whatever. Georgia, Texas, Alabama, Ole Miss. Um, I would I would flip Ole Miss and Alabama. Um, and, and I would even – I mean, whatever. I To me, I had Texas, Georgia, Ole Miss, Alabama in mind. So Texas, you know, over Georgia in a title game scenario. Um, and then Ole Miss, you know, that would put them in the playoffs, you know, with what they have. I think Alabama, that would put them in the playoffs as well. Um, so I, I, I don't know about strong, you know, disagreement. I, I think the Missouri thing is interesting to me because I think Missouri has a very good chance of, of that first weekend of November being in contention for a playoff spot. Um, and, and we're not just talking about four anymore, folks. So don't come at me if you don't know, you know the new playoff format. So I, I, to me, you know, them being behind LSU and, and pretty much sixth on the list, seventh on the list, I think that one to me is, is kind of interesting because I, I do like Missouri and Brady Cook, love Luther Burden. Um, that offense to me, that defense continues to get better. So, you know, it – Chris, it wouldn't surprise me if Missouri's up there fighting with with Ole Miss and, and LSU, you know, for that spot. So I, I think, you know, overall, I think they got it right um, in a sense, you know, Georgia, Texas, and then go from there. But, you know, would it surprise you, brother, if Ole Miss is playing for an SEC title? I mean, it wouldn't for me at all. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Yeah, I think there was a lot of respect shown by the media still to the 
Alabama Crimson Tide to give them 12 for SEC championship votes and put them in that three spot over Ole Miss. I think it's a lot of, hey, we need to see Ole Miss prove it in these big games, which fair, but as we look at the current roster as well, I mean, times are changing, are they not? Well, it's um, also a wishful thinking on some <laughs> with the Alabama right, situation. Right. You know, that, that you're praying this isn't the same Alabama team you know, that started last year, you know, the first three games. Because it's going to be different. Like, it, it's just going to be different. Like, you can vote for Alabama all you want. That's fine. This is going to be different. I, I don't – you know, I, I get the roster that they have and the players, but different decisions when it comes to coaching, the personnel part of this thing, like, it, it's a different ball game. You know, it's not saving and it's saving anymore, obviously. But I want to see – Kevin DeBoer needs to prove it to me. Go to Wisconsin and win that football game. You know, like do something like that to prove, okay, this might be a team worth worrying about this year. Even though, you know, I don't think they lose more than, you know, three games. But I'm just saying in general, like prove it to me. Your SEC champions, that's a, I think that's a little bit much when we don't know the current coaching staff at Alabama. Trey, can't get you out of here without talking about the Tennessee Volunteers. I see the Peyton Manning shrine in the background there. Uh, pick to finish seventh in the SEC, which kind of tells me, you know, they could go one way or another. They're kind of right there in the middle. Um, what are you making of the balls this year? Nico obviously taking over under center. I think they've got one of the best front sevens in the SEC. Personally, for me, Trey, I'll tell you, I had Tennessee finishing fourth in the league. I I'm high on Tennessee this year. I, I feel good about the front seven. I think Nico's the perfect fit in Josh Heupel's system, and they've just got weapons galore. On the offensive side, I'll go as far as to say I had Tennessee beating Alabama in that game in Neyland. Um, your thoughts on Tennessee, or you may be as high on them as I am. Uh, where do you fall on the Volunteers going in this year? By the way, I've got a Peyton picture, I got a Cam Newton, and I got about four other ones. So I know the Peyton one stands out. Yeah, <laughs> but you got to spread the love around the room. Um, I, I, I really like the Josh Heupel system. I think not having Nico play last year a lot until you got to the bowl game. I think that was critical for them. I think you've got a quarterback now. It's pretty much been in the system for two years, pretty much. Knows the system, knows what Josh Heupel wants. Got to sit there and learn last year. I like what they have on offense, man. I do. I, I, you know, you you look at that wide receiving core, look at the, 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 look at the running back situation that they've got. I love Dylan Sampson. Um, I could go on and on, but I'm just trying to give you some starters here. The offensive line is what stands out to me. Tennessee's got a very stable, good offensive line that could protect Nico. And let's see what Nico looks like in these situations where, you know, up tempo, fast paced offense. I know you got a little taste of it in the bowl game, but whatever. Get me to the NC State game for Tennessee and let's figure it out in Charlotte. You know, um, I, I do think. This is a football team that finally – Tennessee's problem over the last number of years, and I won't say the curse word, but this is how I describe these guys. They didn't have an FU guy along the defensive line. Mm -hmm. A guy that got off the bus and you knew, okay, this guy was going to cause me problems all game long. I think when you have Omar Thomas, I think when you got James Pierce coming off the edge, you got problems now with Tennessee's defensive line. And you're gonna have to figure out a way. I don't, I, you know, you gonna double team Pierce coming off the edge. How are you gonna play Big Omar Thomas up the middle? I just feel like now they've got more potential along that defensive line, and I think that's what stands out. I think you know also with the linebacker position with Keenan Peel, um, you bring back a guy. I know Tennessee fans didn't get to see him last year. He got hurt very early. Just go watch what he did to BYU. They have a leader on the defense at linebacker. Um, and so, uh, to me, kind of the only question mark is really the secondary. And so, putting that all together would not surprise me if Tennessee beats Alabama at home. I'll probably never pick Tennessee to beat Florida just because it always goes a different <laughs> direction and there's some crazy-ass thing that happens in that game, you know, usually. Um, but they have got a good chance uh, for like a three-loss season. You know, maybe even two losses. It depends. That schedule is very interesting. Going out to Oklahoma, you know, to me is very interesting. That whole darn week, it's going to be, hey, Josh, how do you feel like about going back to Oklahoma? You know, it, and he was already sick of that question in Dallas. So, you know, I just feel like Tennessee, from a personnel standpoint, 
they continue to kind of build towards the future and they continue what they started when Hypo first arrived in the quarterback situation. I'm, I'm just fascinated to see what Nico looks like this year, because again, we got that little taste, but man, if he is on page with Hypo and they get this helmet communication thing down, and I know they've been, every school in the country has been working on this thing for, you know, seven months now, but that's another layer of this too. You know, you're going to have your head coach talking to you in your ear. Um, and a lot of teams will still do signals, but I'm, I'm saying this as kind of a new quarterback in the league, so the bowl game last year, like that's big. Like how does that play out for him? How does that help him as a quarterback? I just think he's got the running backs to do it, the wide receivers to do it. It all depends on, again, can the defense keep up with the offense? You know, and this is not a Joe Milton situation. This is a kid in Nico who can hit those 40, 50 yard, you know, passes down the field. You know, he can hit a soft fade without throwing it at 110 miles per hour like Joe Milton did. God bless him. You know, he's such an interesting quarterback to watch. But I do like, you know, I do like Tennessee this year to, to kind of turn the meds. And I think at the same time, maybe win a couple games that, that folks probably teetering on, including that Alabama game, which will be so much fun uh, in Knoxville. Trey, last thing and we'll get you out of here. Was there a bigger winner from SEC Media Days than Nick Saban at the SEC Network desk? God bless Nick Saban, brother. <laughs> I, you know, thank you, man. Thank you, Nick. You know, we we appreciate you. Us in the media. Um, I never expected so much golden content coming from him. I, I never did. He he really has come into his own over the last year. Over the last full year, when he started appearing with McAfee, mm -hmm. uh, when he started doing more media appearances, you know, outside the normal realm for him, um, he's turned into a character, man. And he's got, and we all, I always knew Nick Saban was a funny guy. Um, it's just the public didn't get to see it. I think having him on, and the, and the good part about it is, you know, he was rotating with different cast members up there. Um, and, and him say, like, it's so weird seeing Nick asking questions to Kirby and, and Nick asking questions to Steve Sarkeesian and Lane Kip. He's got so many connections to these guys. It's just very awkward is probably the way to put it. Like right now I'll get used to it. We'll all get used to it, but it's going to be, it's going to be fun. I thought he did a great job in his preparation for this. I was talking to Ryan McGee and a couple others about this, his preparation for what he was doing through the roof. That guy was ready for SEC media days. And I just feel like the, the four letter network ESPN is going to benefit from it. I think the fans are going to benefit from this and you're going to continue seeing Nick Saban in a, a dominant role and having that presence. And I don't know, it was still weird. Not, you know, seeing him get up to the podium and, quietly talk for 13 minutes and then answer a couple questions and then get on his jet and go back to, you know, Tuscaloosa. Um, just seeing him walk the hallways and hanging out and talking to us in the media, like it was, it was very different. And I do think that there are going to be some awkward times this year. <laughs> and I look forward to that first time they go to Tuscaloosa and he's having to maybe pick against Alabama. Like that's, the, that's the small things that I look forward to when it comes to this, but he, he's a great ambassador for the game. If, if you could, you could hate him while he's at Alabama because he was winning so much and some of the decisions he made and, and whatnot. But I truly think fans are going to come to enjoy Nick Saban and just, they just got to get past what he did at Bama and enjoy what he's doing now. Trey Wallace of OutKick, one of the best in the business and someone I am proud to call a friend and a colleague in this business. Trey, appreciate you taking the time, my friend. Let folks know where they can check out all your work at OutKick. Yeah, absolutely, buddy. Enjoyed this so very much. Um, you can follow me on social media, Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, at Trey Wallace underscore. Same thing with Instagram, doing different polls and stuff like that during the day, posting stories, and then all the work at OutKick.com. So, just rolling along here, man, as, uh, as we're getting closer to practice starting in 10 days for most teams, actually sooner than that. So we're here. So let's, let's just get it rolling. Trey, appreciate you taking the time, my friend. Let's definitely do it again soon. Thank you, brother. I look forward to it.